Well, um, welcome to uh, day two or three of reInvent here at, uh, and, for, and, and for joining us at, uh, and thank you for joining us for, uh, from dial-up to DevOps. Uh, my name is Elon Rabinovich. Uh, I lead the longtime Datadog user, now lead our community and evangelism team. Uh, and today we're going to talk a little bit about uh, moving to the cloud, monitoring, and just you know, sort of how, how AOL has adopted, uh, has, has adopted Datadog in that process. A lot of, a lot of focus on, on, on culture and, and DevOps and how that enables these things. Uh, and this is uh, my co-presenter, Alan. Hey, guys. I'm uh, Alan Milford. I'm from AOL's London office. I'm a system architect there. I've been there about six years. Um, so I'm just going to basically talk about some of our experiences that we've had going from where we were back in the day to uh, you know, the current systems we've run with now. So um, I guess we'll just kick straight off with it. There aren't many uh, modern internet-based businesses that can claim they were founded before the start of the World Wide Web. But AOL was one of those, um, founded back in 1983, which was just slightly before I was founded. Um, <laughs> you know, back when computers looked a bit like this, uh, hands up who actually owned one of these, anyone in the room? No? Oh, a couple, a couple, that's impressive. <laughs> so obviously, I mean, a few things have changed in that time um, in basically the, the entire industry, and almost everything that brought us to all to reinvent here has happened in that time since 1983. Um, and not least of which, a few things have changed for us as a business. Um, we're obviously primarily known as the company that got 35 million people online for the first time, but that's not necessarily what it's like on the inside for us anymore. Um, at this point in time, we're actually made up of 68 different businesses. In the last few years, that's mostly focused on a couple areas. Uh, the first is content, so we're responsible for hosting some of the world's on, like, biggest online content brands like the Huffington Post, TechCrunch and Gadget, MapQuest, some of you, uh, well, a lot of you might use. Um, but the other side of the business is advertising, of which we're made up of 15 different companies. Um, starting back in 2004, where we purchased advertising.com, we've purchased a lot of companies in various sectors from uh, display advertising on the desktop, mobile video, analytics, uh, data science, and all these companies come together and allow us to offer a comprehensive product offering of online advertising across desktop, mobile, and TV, under the banner of AOL platforms, which is where I live. So with all this coming together, what does this look like internally for us? Well, obviously, with that many businesses, we've got many complex systems. Um, and advertising in itself is a particularly complex industry. It's not just the case if you have a bank of servers serving ads in the background. Um, all of the systems we, we run tend to be extremely high traffic. Uh, now, what do I mean by high traffic? Well, so one of the talks I went to yesterday was on uh, mitigating denial of service attacks. And the example they gave was at one point at peak, the system was receiving 200,000 requests per second. Um, and this was like a really bad attack. Whereas for us, that's kind of like minimal load for some of our systems. Now, obviously, we run with a significantly larger server farm than they do, but that's the kind of our minimum load. Up to our maximum load systems, where we cost Geo, um, sorry, geo distributed across the world, we're looking at something in the region of one to two million requests a second for some of our applications. And all of these applications have to reply um, very, very quickly. We're talking in the region of one to two milliseconds, five milliseconds, something like that. Uh, because the whole chain of advertising starts from something like a bid request, where a user has hit a web page, and then the exchange calls a load of ad providers, and one of them decides how much that user is worth. And this has got to happen extremely quickly, because at the end of the day, the users hit the page, and it needs to be rendered before they've kind of gone off and done something else. And as a, a secondary result of that, it's kind of obvious that downtime really isn't an option for us in any of these systems, because it's not an application that users are coming to directly to us. So just our users are affected. We're delivering ads on thousands of other websites. So if our systems are down, that's thousands of other websites which have got a hole in the page or something's not rendering correctly. And you know, a lot of tools around the world are going to be start alerting, you know, something's going wrong here. And you don't want to be on the end of the phone when 2,000 people phone up and say, my website's broken. That's, that's not a good place to be. And so following on from that, that also means that every transaction that goes through our system has a cost and a value to someone whether that's an advertiser who has purchased an ad and wants to perhaps sell a product or a service to an end user, whether that's us that's running the infrastructure, or whether that's a publisher who's expecting a payment for showing an ad on their website. If any part of the system is broken, someone is going to be losing money somewhere. And this is not something we can you know, have. 
So what does DevOps actually mean to us? Well, some of you, most of you probably have gone to DevOps talks before, and, and there's probably a hundred different ways you can describe DevOps. But the way I like to look at it is, essentially, it's a contraction of two terms, right? You have development and operations. Developers like to go as quickly as possible from an idea, develop software really quickly, and end up with a piece of software. Operations like to take that piece of software that the developers have kindly put together, and as stably as possible, put it into production, and keep it stable in production. Now, you can obviously see there's uh, a bit of a conflict here at times, because developers are like, hey, let's use this new cool thing, and at 2 o'clock on a Sunday morning, an operations engineer gets paged, and it's suddenly it's not such a cool thing for them. So how have we kind of... Uh, how have we kind of broken this down into sections and how have we kind of written, broken down some of these bridges effectively that we're kind of keeping people apart? Well, a good way I like to um, think about this is um, CAMs. Um, and two guys, uh, John Willis and Damon Edwards, coined this a few years ago in one of their DevOps Day talks. And it kind of breaks down the four key areas you really need to start thinking about if you're looking at building a flexible DevOps culture inside your business. Um, and we'll swing back to some of these areas in a minute. Before we get there, um, I'd like to tell you a story about uh, when I first joined the company um, at AOL. So, six years ago, um, I joined AOL in London. And at the time, we were starting a brand new advertising team. Um, we were a research and development team at the time. And we were tasked with building a new ad product for us. Now, if I said, who in the audience knows what a dynamically retargeted ad is? Well, that's less than I thought, actually. Well, so uh, a dynamically retargeted ad, at least the way we describe it, is where you've gone and looked at a product or a service. Um, that interest has been registered somewhere. And then the ad follows you around the entire internet <laughs> until you can no longer stand it anymore. Uh, any, everyone familiar with those ads now? Yeah? There's a lot more nodding heads here. <laughs> Uh, so, I mean, we, we were putting this team together, and um, what we really, really wanted to do was make this experience a little less painful to the user, right? And not have it so intrusive, yes, I know, I've seen that product, and all these kind of things. Um, and believe me, no one knows about the annoyance of retargeted ads more than the teams who build retargeted ads. Um, one of my colleagues, for example, uh, when we were kind of working on this, uh, he, uh, he was searching for a jewelers in London to replace his watch strap. And then his uh, girlfriend at the time started getting retargeted with engagement rings from that same jeweler, which, as you can imagine, was probably a fun conversation. But uh, thankfully, they're married now, so that, that's, that's all on the bridge. Um, anyway, so we were, um, we were starting this, this new team in London. Um, we had five engineers uh, and a couple of product guys. We kind of knew roughly what we, what we wanted. Um, and we also had the advantage that because we were in London, we were removed from um, perhaps some of the harder standards that the larger engineering groups in AOL had. Uh, so we had the flexibility to kind of um, go out and look for the right tool to uh, you know, solve the problem we were looking at. So that meant we were looking at a lot of relatively new and untested software at the time, uh, which, as you can imagine, caused some problems. And you know, we had no QA either. We were just five engineers, two product guys, running new software on a new product. I mean, this, this sounds like a little recipe for disaster, right? Everything was new. But not necessarily. Because if you think about the first thing in the CAMS acronym, it's culture. And as it happened, uh, the team I was working with had all worked together before in one way or another. Um, London's a smaller tech industry than you might think. And through various different positions at various different companies, a lot of us knew each other already, which made life a lot easier. Because despite the fact we had a particularly tight deadline and you know, we were working with a lot of unknowns, we knew how each other worked. Uh, we knew how to not step on toes what was going to make someone angry. And so we were able to hit the ground running pretty quickly um, and kind of you know, really get some momentum into what we were building. So we started building our web application, which starts the way that most web applications start. We have a web server that writes some data to a database. Um, and in our case, what we were serving out of the web server was just a small, clear image um, that sat on some internal AOL properties. Um, and on when that uh, image was loaded, through the query string, we loaded some data about the page, such as uh, the category, like sports, cars, shopping, etc. Um, and then we logged this into the database. 
And this formed the kind of the first basis of our data collection there, as we called it, um, just so we could start testing how we could efficiently collect this data before we kind of did some more in-depth analysis on it. And so from there, we started collecting data. And then we very quickly needed a second database. So we sharded our database. And then as we started rolling out more, we needed a second web server. And then we needed to grow some more. But by this point, we, we sort of deployed on a few, um, a few of the mid-sized AOL properties where we were collecting a reasonable amount of data. Um, but we wanted to kind of scale that up and do a full-scale uh, deployment across some of the real large AOL properties where we're talking hundreds of thousands of requests per second. So it was time to scale up properly and take our kind of basic design of an application and actually you know, be able to run it at a much, much larger scale. But how do you do that? How do you scale up an application to a proper production workload and a scale the size of AOL? Well, you take a kind of a rough estimate of all the websites you're going to be running on, because remember, this is, it's, it's kind of like a combination of all the traffic that they have, because they're all going to be hitting you. And then you look at your current load of all your servers, you know, how much CPU am I using, how much memory am I using? And then you kind of put your finger in the air and say, yeah, I, I think roughly that's what it's going to be based on the kind of hardware differences we've got. And you come up with an idea and you say, okay, I'm going to need X number of servers. And then one of you fills out a very long form that said, I'd like 25 servers, please. And then you email this form to someone else in the business, who emails it to someone else, who uh, contacts the vendor and said, hello, I'd like to buy 45 servers, please. And then it says, okay, that'll be fine. That'll be, uh, you know, four to five weeks. And you're like, okay. Then four to five weeks later, all these lovely shiny servers arrive on the edge of your data center. And someone kind of takes them in, plugs them into the rack, and then pass them on to another team, which installs the OS, does the networking, security, et cetera. Then that team passes it on to your operations team. And eventually, somewhere down the line, they come back to you and say, okay, all those servers you ordered eight weeks ago, we're now ready to install them which is great, fantastic. It's only eight weeks have gone by. Brilliant. And this is what we ended up with. So this was, this was kind of a, like a rough, slightly simplified view of what our application looked like um, at our first scale production release. At the top in gray, we had our central tier of uh, load balancers, which were managed by AOL Central Tech. Um, and everything else in blue was our application. So we had a tier of web servers, that then wrote to a series of message queues. And then we had some processing workers, which then took that and offloaded it into the database. Um, we added that extra step in at about 4.35 one morning after we discovered some particularly interesting quirks of uh, the way things were being cached and uh, you know, databases falling over and that. So it just, just made sense to kind of abstract that just a little bit. And although we were in um, one data center at this point, we were pretty solid in terms of how we could handle failures, at least in this, this kind of one unit. Because um, if any of our web servers died, we had enough there to take over the load. Redundant message queues, redundant processing workers, and a sharded database uh, that was replicated within itself. So you know, we were pretty certain that we could handle um, you know, disk failures, server failures, even a rack failure to an extent. So we were done. All right, fantastic. Our architecture's up, it's running, everything's stable, everything's working as expected, our product owners are happy, we're happy, and everything is running smoothly. If any of you run a website or are in advertising, this is kind of what you would probably generally expect in terms of a traffic graph. Um, you tend to see this kind of sine wave of max traffic over the day, every single day, and you know, it kind of goes along with this. So if you're seeing this every day, it's, it's generally a good thing. You get, you get to see some interesting things as well, like where well, there's a big sports game, you've got a little peak where everyone turns off the TV and goes on the internet to complain about how their favorite team lost and a few interesting things like that. But we were in this position and we were relatively happy. And then uh, something else happened. We came in one Monday morning, looked at our monitoring that we were very happy with, and it looked like this. Now, not that there's ever a good time of the week to, uh, to come in and discover this, but I can tell you a Monday morning isn't, isn't the best time. Um, so naturally we're thinking, okay, what, what's gone wrong in this situation? It's gotta be something wrong with the monitoring. There's, there's, you know, there's, there's just, it's gotta be the monitoring. Uh, so we started looking into uh, you know, what, what actually happened, what the problem was, and uh, ended up kind of trying to SSH into the servers, figure out whether monitoring had failed, and getting an idea of what the infrastructure still looked like. Um, and about kind of 30 minutes later, we had a good idea of you know, what we were left with. Uh, and that was this. <laughs> yep. 
that's, uh, that's pretty much the reaction we had as well at the time. Um, so, so what had happened? Well, at that time on a Monday morning, actually it was kind of Sunday night, Monday morning, we had a complete data center outage, completely. And at this point, I should, will point out that this wasn't one of our own facilities. We were in another, another data center in a small suite at this time. Um, but they were doing some power maintenance overnight. And of course, we'd all ignore the email that said, uh, we're just going to be doing some maintenance. Don't worry, everything will be fine, because uh, it always is. Um, but all the power had gone off, um, not just for us, for everyone in the entire facility. Now, I did have a little bit of sympathy for, uh, for these guys on the other end of the phone, at, uh, because having worked in a data center, I, I kind of know what this situation is like, where there's kind of a catastrophic power outage. And I imagine a lot of you probably came here on a plane. It's a bit like when you get to the gate um, and the captain's turned off the jet engines and they're just kind of spooling down. You hear that kind of <sighs> Sounds a bit like that. And then people kind of look at each other and there's a nice eerie silence for a couple of seconds. And then every phone, alarm, pager, everything kind of in earshot starts going off and then just doesn't stop going off for what seems like forever. So I, I, had a, I had a bit of a sympathy for the guys on the other end of the phone. But as a customer, this was particularly difficult for us because short of us driving to the data center with a truck, picking up all our servers and driving to another data center and plugging them in, there was nothing we could do to recover this situation quicker. Things were coming up in a random order, machines were coming back sporadically, um, and because of the rather beta software we were using at the time for our database, we were getting data corruption, even though technically the architecture we had should have been able to cope with that. Another thing I should probably point out here is the reason we didn't have a proper DR plan in place for this is we were still an R&D team. Um, we weren't taking any kind of paying customers up through this, so it didn't make sense for us to kind of completely replicate our architecture in another data center at this time, just to put that there. <laughs> Um, so, I mean, the recovery time at this point was completely out of our hands. And this is not a good place to be. Now, being uh, British, I couldn't come to America and not throw in a Winston Churchill quote. Um, I'm not entirely sure he was talking about software engineering in this particular quote, but it seems like a particularly apt one. Uh, and that success consists of going to failure, from failure to failure without loss of enthusiasm. Um, and if there's one thing any software engineer knows, it's you're going to fail, and often. And the first thing you probably have to get over in your career is kind of that sense of, I've screwed something up. <laughs> what do I do about this? So, I mean, this isn't going to work for us. Right? We, need, we need to kind of get out of this situation and make sure that this kind of thing doesn't happen again, no matter how remote the chances of it are. So we kind of went back to the drawing board um, across the whole of the platforms business at the same time, actually. It just happened that it coincided with what my team was going through. And we looked at our whole development cycle was the first thing we did. And with many companies, the first thing they tend to do is kind of throw out waterfall development and software engineering and start adopting a more agile model, um, whether that's Scrum or Kanban. But the important thing for us here was breaking down some of those uh, lines of communication where you had your dev teams talking to an ops team who would talk to someone else, who would talk to someone else, who would buy a server, and then you kind of go all the way back again. So we started forming uh, virtual teams of small squads, where if we needed to build a particular feature, um, we would have a team of engineers, uh, sorry, a few engineers, a QA, an operations uh, engineer, all in kind of one virtual team together. And they were responsible for individual features, individual products. So no longer were you kind of having these big meetings between teams, between all the developers, between all the QAs, between all the operations, and these email threads that lasted forever, and you had to find the right comment you wanted, it was kind of like tabbed in about a million times. You didn't have to do that because these four people you were actually having to talk to were either on your desk or you know, in the same chat group or something like that. And it was great. And we were removing the manual steps out of the process of having to pass things between teams. And much, much better. So in general, the way we kind of took it from here is that what Agile methodology gave us in software engineering is taking that idea and making it into a piece of software. DevOps kind of encompassed that and the rest of the ecosystem as well. It's how do you take that idea that you've developed into software, put it in production, and then iterate on that and encompass the whole kind of ecosystem. So earlier, uh, Alan uh, referenced CAMS, the, or the CAMS model that uh, were coined by uh, John Willis and Damon Edwards. They're sort of early on thought leaders in the, uh, in the, in the DevOps space. 
Um, if you've not read any of their writing or listened to their, you know, their podcasts or their talks, I encourage you to, to do that. They're, um, they're quite brilliant. Um, but, you know, CAM stands for, uh, is, is a short acronym. It's sort of, this is the, the four pillars of DevOps, I like to call it. These are the themes of how I think about DevOps. I, I know if I pull the audience, as Alan was doing earlier, all of you will have a very different definition of DevOps. Some of you guys will think that it's, you're a, that just means that you're, you're, that's a new name for sysadmin, and I wear that title, and I get paid more money now, and this is great. Uh, some of you think that it's, uh, you know, it means that there are no more ops people. We're all just engineers. We write some code together. Uh, there's lots of different definitions of what DevOps means. Uh, but, you know, this, for me, all of that doesn't matter. It's about the themes and the goals of why we're doing this and why we're working together. So, again, culture, automation, measurement, and sharing, and we'll dive into some of each of these components separately uh, here and, and, and it just sort of dive into what they mean and, and, and how they apply. So, culture. Um, Look, we're all here at reInvent. I know you all love your tools. There's somebody here that loves Chef. There's somebody here that loves Puppet. There's somebody here that loves Perl still, uh, or you know, Fortran, whatever it is that you like. You love your tools. We, 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 you know, we're, 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 we're all craftsmen, and we like the tools that we use to, you know, to, to, to work on our craft. Um, but the reality is that none of that matters. Um, what matters is that we're working together as a team. You know, Alan, Alan mentioned earlier. Um, you know, the steps going between teams, teams not having, you know, potentially having different metrics or goals that they need to hit, not necessarily being well aligned. This is where culture comes in, right? If your people aren't aligned, you could have the most amazing tools in the world. They're just not building the thing that you needed them to build as a company. They're building what I wanted to build in my silo and what you wanted to build in your silo. Made my job easier, but didn't make us any money. Um, and so that's, that's, you know, this is, that, this is the importance of culture. It's working together, again, seeing the, the, pro the problem as the enemy, the problem being whatever we're trying to build or attack or... Uh, resolve an incident, whatever it might be, uh, and not, not the guy across the hall from us that might have introduced some sort of a memory leak that woke you up at, at 2 in the morning. Uh, you know that you're on the same team, you're working together. So this is culture. And again, it's more important than any tool. Um, we, need to, you know, we need to be working together here. So this is a great analogy for DevOps, in my opinion. Right? Does everybody know what we're looking at here? Yep. yep. So as, as, as you have all sort of uh, mentioned, this is a, this is a, this is a barn raising. Um, now you'll notice, uh, how many power tools do you see here? Any skill saws or like things with Makita logos on them or uh, anything with a power, like electric, you know, battery in it? No, right? Um, we're using 200-year-old methods to build a barn in a day, probably even less than a day. And we're doing it successfully over and over and over again. This is success. Think about this next time you're arguing about whether or not you should be writing something in Chef or Puppet or Ansible versus doing it in Bash scripts or Perl scripts or whatever the thing that you used to do is. It's not about the tool. It's about working together towards a common goal and getting, it, getting the job done. Um, so similarly, we talked earlier about the different types of DevOps teams. You have folks that are specialists, and you have, you know, if you have, you have organizations where everybody specializes, you have organizations where everybody's a generalist. Um, in these communities that, build these, that do these barn raisings, they have similar, they're not all the same. Some communities do their DevOps or barn ops uh, <laughs> um, in a situation where everybody's a generalist, they get the job done, they move on. In other communities, they have people that specialize in like joisting or, uh, you know, some, or some other part of the process. And they, they are experts in that, and that is all that they do. And nobody else can touch that. And everybody else, you know, handles other pieces. Um, so similarly, so when you're thinking about DevOps and you're thinking about how to implement some of these ideas in your organization, again, remember that the implementation details are not important. It's these, these themes and these capabilities that we're talking about that are more important. How you get there, that's your own journey. And I'm happy to chat with you about that uh, later as well. But, um, you know, how many of you guys have, uh, we just talked about how people are your most important resource. How many of you guys have an open headcount that you've been trying to fill for six months or more? I mean, everybody's sort of raising their hand under the table here, but yes, like, people are, people are our bottleneck at this point. It's no longer waiting eight weeks for a server to show up from one of the many manufacturers that will sell you servers. Uh, it's about getting people to, to do something with those servers or to think about the problems that we need to solve, design where we need to go. And this is where automation comes in. This is the A in CAMS. Uh, um, so once you get your people aligned and you're working in the right direction, you know where you want to go, get yourself a crane. Move faster. Sure, get yourself some of that modern technology that we've all been talking about, those tools we love, and become an expert in them, become a, a craftsman in your trade. Um, but, you know, again, what you'll notice is there's a guy at the top of that crane there with a walkie-talkie, and he's not, like, just dropping containers wherever he feels like doing it. He's talking with the rest of the team and communicating about the plan. They know what ship it's going to go on or where they're going to drop the piece of wood or whatever it might be. And so think about it in the same way. When you're working with your tools, um, you want to do the same thing in your organization. Try to scale up with, uh, as you're scaling up, communicate with others uh, and scale up with code rather than with people because you're not going to be able to, you can't throw people at this problem forever. You need to, uh, you know, be able to move a little bit faster than that. 
with that. Yeah, so as Elon mentioned, it's all about kind of scaling up with the code rather than the people. And uh, I mean, with a conference of 24,000 people, I'm sure there's at least one person here with a t-shirt that says, be quiet before I replace you with a very small shell script. And this is, so, so some laughs, you may have seen them already. If you haven't, tweet me a picture. I'm sure there's at least one here. Uh, we but, have a bet about this, Yeah, please. we had a bet about this, so help us settle it. Uh, <laughs> so, I mean, what does this actually mean? Well, you're not actually replacing uh, people with, with shell scripts, right? What you're doing is you're replacing the busy work that people are doing with shell scripts and freeing them up to do more important tasks that, you know, they probably didn't have time to before. Um, so the way we kind of tackle this in, uh, in platforms is, I mean, yes, we were a very old business. We had a lot of build systems internally before. We had a lot of ways of deploying our systems. This, I mean, that way of automating things wasn't new to us. But what was new to us uh, was some of the tooling in place that we had. So we started standardizing on Jenkins for doing our um, continuous integration. And there's a couple of reasons for this. Uh, one, because coming from so many businesses, you kind of immediately cut down the ways that people wanted to do things. Um, there was no longer 15 ways of deploying an application. There was just one way, and one dashboard where teams could look at everyone else's build pipeline and say, oh, that looks a bit cool. I'll take, uh, I'll take a bit of that, and I'll take a bit of that. And there was kind of a standard approach where if you were jumping between teams, you kind of knew how it was going to work and didn't have to train yourself up on another way of automating whatever it was they were doing. And of course, the other important thing is when you are building, uh, bringing new people into the company, the chances are they're going to be more familiar with Jenkins than the 20-year-old build system you're using. Um, so again, that's another kind of key benefit that you get by doing this. And of course, the next step from that is once we've got our continuous integration, how do we deploy things? So we standardized on Chef inside data services. And again, it took away all those kind of custom shell scripts that team had between the different applications and different operations teams had. And there was just kind of one way. There's a recipe. You know generally how Chef works between teams. And it's like, OK, we're going to standardize on doing this. And we started building up kind of a library of common recipes between all the teams. So we kind of try to share knowledge and share understanding. But an important thing about automation is those times when it kind of gets you out of a hole or a bit of trouble that you didn't know was coming around the corner. Um, and there, there's one particular time, um, which over, <laughs> over the last few years, uh, it kind of saved us from something unexpected. And uh, what that was was we, as a team, had been working particularly hard to uh, implement a new feature that um, we were going to deploy to our first paying client, as it happened, from the system we were working on originally. Um, and what this client wanted was uh, some geotargeting uh, capabilities. So things like, uh, if this person's in this area of the UK, then we'd like to show them this ad, et cetera. But this isn't something we built into our application before. So we were finalizing up all this code, um, and it'd been a bit of a push. And one Friday morning, we were kind of there, just finishing this all off, ready to go into sort of pre-prod on Monday um, for some final testing, and then release to the client the following week. And we were all there busy working away, getting all these bugs fixed, getting the last bit of functionality in. Um, and then all of a sudden, someone ran up the stairs in our office, screaming, get out, there's a, there's, there's a crazy person, you know. And we were like, what? Ran down the stairs again, didn't see where they went. Um, and so we were kind of looking at each other, thinking, well, that was weird. Like, don't know what's going on here. So we thought, okay, we'll we just, whatever. We'll take a break, see what's going on, take five minutes. And my colleague and I walked down the stairs, and this person's nowhere to be seen. Okay. And it, kind of everyone's in the whole office kind of looking confused, you know, what's going on. Um, and then we kind of just looked outside again, nothing to be seen. Um, and there's a Starbucks at the end of our street, so we're like, look, let's just go and get a coffee um, and just, you know, regroup for a few minutes and then kind of get on with the work we need to do the rest of the morning. So we get to the end of the road, and uh, it's on the corner of Tottenham Court Road, and I don't know if any of you know it in London, but it's, it's a long, straight road that's one way. Uh, and we turn the corner and uh, look back up the road. Again, there's nothing much we can see. And then look the other way, and confronted with what I can only describe as basically the entire metropolitan police force coming down the road towards us. This was people in day-glow jackets running, bikes, cars, vans, SWAT vans, helicopters, you name it, basically coming towards us. At this point, we kind of look at each other like, oh. uh, well, I guess something is going on then. Uh, and then uh, 10 minutes later, we were backed up behind police tape. Um, and uh, you know, we're really kind of unsure what's going on at this point. And things are very rapidly escalating, getting much more serious. 
Uh, the police, I mean, you can see just in the distance there, this, this was basically all the police, and they kept pushing us back and back and back, and the cordon was getting wider and wider. Um, and then suddenly, like, computers were coming out of office windows, filing cabinets out into the street. Um, a few minutes later, guys with balaclavas and sniper scopes were running down the street, setting up on the buildings. And, you know, news crews were arriving, and we're like, okay. Then we found out it was actually in our building, just the other side of the wall of where we were working, that uh, someone had apparently taken some hostages and was threatening them that he had a bomb. And we're like, okay, well, everyone's out of the building. That's fine. We're all safe, you know, we're just tweeting away, you know, don't know what's going on. But we still had code in the building, the other side of that wall, right? <laughs> Uh, and this, is, this was something we couldn't evacuate very easily. So, I mean, how do we get out of this situation? Well, sort of, we suddenly realized that everyone's scrabbling around on the phone trying to find the, uh, you know, the security certificate to jump on the VPN, trying to figure out what the endpoint was off the top of your head because you haven't used it before on your new phone. And then downloading an SSH client to try and get into your dev box you know, to figure out actually what was going on. And then eventually managed to commit, uh, commit the code thankfully, from the street. And this is the, this is the actual commit message from the time. Now, why in particular was this important, right? Because I knew that by doing this, our build system would pick it up and replicate the code off-site. So even if the absolute worst happened, we could then be okay, you know, and we could come back the next week and kind of recover it. But thankfully, it turned out, that, you know, it, this guy didn't have what he said, and, uh, and everything kind of calmed down, and... Everything was fine, um, and you know we all had a good laugh about it afterwards. Except two of my colleagues, who uh, one of which had just flown back from the U.S. and uh, left his house keys in the office and couldn't get them for nine hours, and another one of my colleagues who was flying to Dublin that day had his passport in his pocket, but all his clothes in the office and had to fly, leaving all his clothes and buy some when he got there. So uh, aside from those two guys, everything turned out okay. But you never know when automation is going to get you out of a hole like this. Um, I mean, we certainly, when we built our build system, didn't think this is what we were going to be using it for, committing from a mobile phone in the street. Uh, but, you know, hey, it worked. It got us out of the situation. And as it happens, uh, this same release um, is actually, <laughs> completely by coincidence, was the same release where we stopped using physical servers and we went to the cloud. We started using virtual machines. Um, now, we did this um, in a way that perhaps a few companies may have come across. Um, inside AOL, we had a lot of uh, infrastructure already. We had a lot of data centers, a lot of space, a lot of teams who knew how to run data centers and servers. Um, but we didn't have the flexibility to sort of use the more virtual environments that teams were taking advantage of in other companies. So how do we get around this is uh, we set up a cloud team internally. And we started building our own internal private cloud. And this team was responsible for uh, building a completely new interface that development teams could go to and say, look, I want to spin up five virtual machines with two CPUs, 32 gigs of RAM, et cetera. And then 10 minutes later, the team had their machines, which was fantastic. There's no more waiting eight weeks for this thread of paperwork to go back and forth and you know, machines to be delivered and all that. Um, so almost instantly, development speed was increased because you could get things to production much quicker and there was no more waiting on hardware. But one of the other advantages that this gave us was um, overnight parity between all different development environments. Uh, so that's going from where people were developing on their laptop to copying it to like a basic dev environment, which is probably an old desktop somewhere in the corner of the office to another environment, which is QA or pre-prod, which is an old server in the back of the data center somewhere. And then eventually, it's you got you know, your full production server, which is generally the, probably the most expensive with the most CPUs. And you always have that kind of bit of guesswork of, you know, well, it runs this well on my laptop, or it runs this well on this kind of one core, but you know, my production machine has got 16 cores and twice the number of IOPS and things like that. But that was all kind of solved in one fell swoop, basically, because it doesn't matter whether it was dev, QA, or prod, the environment was exactly the same. It was deployed in the same way. It was the same image. And the other advantages we had, that this was all managed in-house, in, at least initially. And you know, we had teams that were responsible for doing this. So we were able to keep our kind of strong internal security model. Um, being the business that we are, with you know, subscriber base and various different services, we have things like personal data, which needs to be completely separate from other data. 
So we were able to keep, you know, keep this. And we didn't have to worry about kind of differences in networking things. But one of the problems we came across is there's kind of a downside in that if you say to development teams, you can just spin up as many machines as you want now, and you know, they'll just be there. They'll just go and do that. I mean, don't give a team a credit card and say, hey, just go and do this, because they will. And then suddenly you'll find that uh, you know, where it was very slowly filling up your data center of physical machines, if you say you can spin up 100 virtual machines, they'll be like, okay. And then your capacity has just kind of gone like that, which was a bit of an issue for us, because provisioning hypervisors then was kind of a lot more difficult, because the cloud team that was responsible for managing this had to go out and buy the servers and go through the whole chain again. But this was hidden from the development teams. And the key thing here is, you know, although uh, dev teams were no longer kind of necessarily aware of, you know, what was going on with all the physical stuff, the capital cost to the business didn't go away. You know, at the, outside of the server room, although you may have been aware about the servers and things, you still had giant rooms that looked like you were trapped in a 90s Windows screensaver. Kind of power distribution units. I don't know exactly what it does, but I mean, it looks heavy and therefore expensive. Um, literally tons of batteries um, and banks and banks of two megawatt generators which would probably restart the world if they, if they needed to. And I mean, this is all kind of stuff that the business is still paying for, still running, but this is kind of completely isolated from most development teams now. They don't really think about this stuff that's going on in the background. So the next logical step for us was to start standardizing on something like AWS and using EC2 instead of our own internal private cloud because that almost overnight enabled us to kind of move this capital expense of buying hardware and managing hardware into a variable expense. We stopped having to worry about hardware refresh times every two years where we'd have to go back to the vendor and return them because, I mean, generally big server contracts tend to be leases rather than you not know, actually buying the hardware. Um, but then we also had, again, the increase in, uh, or sorry, the reduction in time to spin up applications and new servers which again reduced our time to deployment for a lot of applications. So the flexibility to engineers was increased even further and allowed us to try even more things that were new. And generally the whole iteration cycle for software engineering sped up because we weren't waiting on hardware anymore. But when you're sort of moving from a kind of a vertical scaling model where you have few large servers to lots and lots of small servers, uh, you, the way you kind of treat them has to kind of change somewhat. Um, some of you may have heard this phrase before, which is you start treating your servers like cattle and not like pets. What does that actually mean, though? Well, you know, you stop giving them individual names, and you start kind of trying to corral them in kind of one general direction together. Um, when I first started working in the industry, I worked for um, a small ISP that uh, had, I'd say, probably the core servers were in the sort of 10s to 20s in that kind of range for what was managing the main infrastructure. Um, and it was decided at the time that they'd all be named after Hindu deities, which is great. You know, you knew the name of the machine, you knew what it did, you knew how to log into it. But as you started adding more and more servers, you started running out of deities with kind of short names. Um, and as the names kind of grew and grew, and you suddenly find that there's a vital service on something with a lot of letters in it, it, it gets kind of difficult. But even after that point, you know, where you're talking about spinning up the hundreds or thousands of servers to deploy an application, I mean, you can't give them individual names. Well, you, you could, but, uh, you know, you'd spend all your time trying to figure out what the next name should be. So you start treating them the way the farmer would treat cattle. He doesn't give them all a name. He might give one or two. But generally, cattle have got numbers. But there is a but here, right? And it's like, even if you're a farmer and you've got a lot of cattle and you're treating them kind of in a group, herding them into one field or another, you still need to know what the individual cattle or cow is doing. If the cow at the back there is sick, the chances are it's going to make the rest of the herd sick. And then if he loses the herd, that's a lot of money you're going to lose. Likewise, in a software engineering and server management, if one of your machines is not behaving correctly or is you know, causing damage to your infrastructure, if it brings down the whole of your infrastructure, it's going to cost you a lot of money very quickly. So there's, there's a lot of similarities here in the way you need to kind of monitor them and also kind of gather them together. And so, you know, how do we know, how, how do we find out, you know, how that cow is doing? Uh, well, Datadog, we like to say, collecting data is cheap. 
Um, but not having it when you need it can be really expensive, right? We're all here at reInvent. I tried to do the math. I usually have some math that I give here about how, you know, how cheap it is to store data in S3 these days. And it is. The problem is they keep changing the number. So I, you know, it's always going down. So it's even like this sort of proves my point. Collecting data and storing that data is quite cheap in you know, today's era. Uh, and so you know, collect everything that you can. That being said, uh, we haven't made the same progress on time travel. Um, you know, Marty and Doc Brown still have not given me my hoverboard or my DeLorean, uh, and so I can't go back in time when we had an outage and find out why we had that outage, get the data, and, and debug it. So again, collecting data is cheap, but not having it when you need it, super expensive. So what does that mean? Well, if it moves, measure it. And if it doesn't move, you should still measure it, because at some point, it might move, <laughs> uh, and you want to be ready for that. Um, you know, this means asking questions both about, you know, system metrics, but also about business metrics. How's your application performing? How happy are your customers today? Um, you know, how are individual servers working, but how is, are all your servers working together in unison? What is, you know, what does the global uh, um, story look like? And of course, Datadog can help you with that, and I'm not going to pitch, I, you know, I know this is a sponsored session, but this is not a Datadog ad anyways. Come by the Datadog booth down on the expo floor. I'd be happy to give you a demo of all the cool things we can do there. Um, but the important here, thing to know here is, are we getting better, or are we getting, wor are, are we getting worse? Uh, to know that, you have to know where you are today. Otherwise, you, you, can't, you, know, you can't know where point A is. If, how, how long is it going to take to get to point B if you don't know where point A is? Um, and then, of course, making data-based decisions, right? Um, if we want to make decisions based on opinions, I'll tell you right now, mine's always right, yours is wrong, we're done. Uh, but if we want to make data-based decisions, bring your data, we can have a real conversation about and decide what the right approach is. And monitoring will let you do that, uh, and metrics. And this is the M in CAMS. Now, to take, bring this to you know, a real-world analogy, you wouldn't drive down the road with your wipers off or your headlights off. You know that's a bad situation. You want to have some telemetry, some idea of where you're, com where you're, com where you're coming from and where you're going. Um, driving down without any of, any of your lights on or your wipers on would be irresponsible. You'd probably end up in jail over doing something like this, right? Uh, I, you know, I'm not saying that running in production, software in production without monitoring should get you put in jail, but it's definitely irresponsible. Uh, I would argue that you should be monitoring first. Forget test-driven development, monitoring-driven development. Start collecting those metrics from your dev laptop all the way to your dev environments, you know, to staging and to production. Long before you get to production, you'll know what normal is, and then you can plan accordingly um, when something changes. Because the reality is we're all going to crash. We're all going to have a bad situation. We're going to have a bug. Uh, some data center is going to disappear out from under us. We want to know what's going on. We want to be able to catch it before our customers do. Uh, and if we can't catch it before our customers do, at the very least, know how it happens so it doesn't happen again. How many folks do postmortems on their, you know, when they have a failure or you know, some sort of a learning experience when they have a success? Everybody. Awesome. Um, how many people have something like this in their postmortems? I don't know why it happened, but I promise next time I will have monitoring in place and I can tell you, and then we won't have it a third time. Right? You know, nobody, nobody's raising their hands this time. Uh, you know, people are like quietly nodding. They don't want to admit to this, but this is true. And if you haven't heard of this guy, Honest Update, uh, he's this guy, it's a, a Twitter account on Twitter, follow it, it's always hilarious. Uh, but these are the types of things that do show up in people's postmortems. And it doesn't make you look good, it doesn't make your customers look good, it definitely doesn't make your boss happy, because you want to be able to say, I will never let this happen twice. So, uh, again, collecting data is important. Um, when I say collecting data, though, I don't just mean data about your applications and your services. I also mean data about your teams. If you're doing Agile and Scrum, as Alan mentioned, there's likely some sort of velocity that you're tracking about how, like, how, 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 how performant your team is, how quickly they're delivering features or, or stories or tickets. Um, if you're on call, you've got metrics about how often you're being woken up at night. Look at that. Your team can't be as productive if they've been up till 3 in the morning. Um, so this is a report that comes out of Datadog. Uh, you'll get it every week, or you can pull it up in the UI. It lets you slice and dice. Uh, on what teams are getting alerted, what services are alerting, uh, how many alerts are going out, what times of day they're happening. So you can see here, clearly somebody had a, in a data, on a database team had a really bad day. It's like 1,700% more MySQL alerts this week than last week. Don't know what this particular leak was, but clearly a problem. Um, yeah, so um, you know, don't let yourself be that team that gets paged 10,000 times in a week and you go, and, and somebody says to you, hey, um, how many pages did you get? Oh, it's about 10,000. How many people do you have on call? Oh, one. Are you listening to all of them? No, clearly, because you haven't slept if you did. So uh, you know, we want to be able to look at those types of metrics as well, and I've got some fun stories about that, but we'll, we'll move on. Um, sharing. This is the last part. Again, this is the S in CAMS. It sort of falls back on, it's very similar to culture, right? If you've got a good culture, you're likely sharing. Um, the idea is teams should be sharing their data, sharing dashboards, sharing metrics, working together so that we're learning together. When you have a postmortem, share that across your entire organization. Don't, learn, don't, don't hoard the learning for yourself. Let everybody else avoid making the same mistake again. Um, help other people solve their own issues. Uh, help, let them help you. 
Now, everybody should play a part in getting to production and into, you know, into, into the success of the team. Again, we're, we're working, at this, working on this together. Um, the last thing is make sure that you're using the same metrics in the same languages you're talking to, to each other. Don't be like the Mars Climate Orbiter team where like one team was talking in metrics, other ones talking in customary, and they crash satellites into planets because they're just not speaking the same language, right? Um, and so with that, again, play nice with others. So, so um, going to what Elin said, it's like when we started using Datadog for our monitoring, there was a lot of things that we came across that, you know, unexpected things where barriers had been broken down between teams and things were starting to get streamlined. So this is a dashboard that I came across um, a little while ago that uh, five teams had put together by themselves to try and solve an individual issue. Um, and in this case, you see a couple of blank graphs on the right. Um, if there was any data in those graphs, we know that the issue they were trying to solve hadn't been solved effectively. But because all the data was available between all the different teams, that they were just able to go in one place, let's just throw up a dashboard, and you know, we know between us what's going on in our ecosystem. There was no more kind of like each individual team had a kind of silo of data. Um, and I mean, especially, look, we know it almost better than anyone else is that coming from so many businesses, you name a monitoring tool, we probably had it somewhere in AOL, whether it's, you know, Zabbix, Cacti, Xenos, we, we basically had them all. Um, but now, because they're all in kind of one place, teams can just go in and go, hey, that team I'm working with, they've got a kind of a bit of a blip here, uh, what can we do about this? And, you know, we suddenly had these more interactive tools that instead of our ops engineers coming in, and the first thing they'll say to you is, hey, thanks for waking me up this morning at 3 a.m., that was awesome, you know, I totally enjoyed that. Because teams are now more interactively looking at kind of what's going on and highlighting things, instead of like uh, in a post-mortem sense coming back and saying this is what happened, it's, hey guys, this uh, got a bit of an uptick here, do you know what's going on here? And them instantly getting kind of uh, notified in their Slack channel so they can kind of look at it preemptively before things really start to go wrong. So I mean, just to kind of round up, um, you know, what did we learn uh, from this kind of process going from where we were to kind of where we are now? And the first thing is you really need to kind of push hard to refactor your applications when you're moving from a traditional kind of vertical scaling uh, data center model to a kind of a cloud ops model. Um, and there's, a few th there's a few reasons for this. Number one is you're probably not going to be using it as efficiently as you can if you just kind of pick up your application and throw it in the cloud. Um, the second point is uh, changing people's mindsets in your business is a lot harder than changing the technology. Um, hands up who's come across people that say we've always done it this way. Yeah, yeah. basically everyone. Uh, you know, that's much more difficult than installing the new version of Jenkins or Jira or something like that. But then coming back to the data point is you start giving people the data to make their own decisions and empower them to make decisions based on that. So they know exactly what's going on in the ecosystem. They know how to solve it because there's no more kind of guesswork of you know, driving down the road without your lights on. But the key thing here is, you know, don't search for a silver bullet in your organization to solve this. Um, I mean, this is a learning process for everything, and the data is absolutely key to what's going on. And understanding your workloads about how your servers and your applications are performing in real-world production scale. Um, I mean, the analogy I, I like to give is you wouldn't heat your home all day in summer. Um, in Britain, obviously, coming to Vegas, maybe a better example would have been you wouldn't run your AC all day in winter. Um, I wish they didn't in my hotel room. Got back last night, it was freezing. Um, so likewise, in production scale, where we used to buy physical machines to uh, handle your maximum peak load that you're expecting, and the rest of the time they were just kind of heating up a data center somewhere. If you're doing that in the cloud, you're just kind of burning money effectively, right? Scale down for the load you're currently using and then scale up when you need it. Don't, don't be running things for your maximum load all the time. So just to kind of finish off, uh, there's three points I'd like you to take away from this. Um, the first one is build a culture that can quickly adapt to change. Whether that's inside your team, in between teams, if something is going to come over the horizon and surprise people, you want them to be like, hey, this is, this is pretty cool. We should get on this. And not like, Ugh, don't really feel like doing that. We'll just kind of keep doing what we're doing because that's not going to help. And that's regardless of whether it's new tooling or new process. And when you bring in that new process, that process should make life easier for people and not just be a checklist. Okay, let's just do a quick poll of how many people have filled in 50 fields in a JIRA ticket and had no one ever read it. Yep, yep. That's a process that's not making life easier for people. It's busy work, right? Make sure it's actually making life better for someone. And finally, when you find a good way of working, don't get complacent about it. Because technology in this industry moves incredibly quickly and a lot quicker than it is to kind of move the people and the teams behind it that are running it. 
So make sure you've always got your eye on kind of the horizon of what's going on and kind of ear to the ground almost um, of how things are going in your business. So that's about it from us. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, tweet at us if you see that person with a T-shirt. Yeah.